A Humament is probably the work you're best known for. I just wanted to start by briefly talking about that. I have just finished A Humament, yes. It's taken me 50 years to do so, and I've had to do it twice. I started it in 1966, and so 50 years later, I've drawn a line under it, almost, and won't do any more to it now. So you had two books that you were working on, two separate books, or did you change the first book and make a second book? No, version? it was the same book. I did it once right through, making pictures and finding words in it, and then thought, I could do this better, and uh, well, I thought I could. Actually, I think I did, so I did a whole second version. I've read one passage, it was on page 54, and it said, modernise England and Europe me. <laughs> well. That was a kind of old-fashioned. That was a long time ago I wrote that. I wouldn't write it now. I would say, re-Europe me. But uh, too late to say, I suppose. I wanted to say there was something, you know, vibrant in English art at the time. And we should go independent in that sense. But I wasn't thinking, you know, let's leave the whole thing. I don't change anything on the page, except find little bits and then join them together with various, what well, we call it, rivers in the type. So and then they follow one from another. And one finds all sorts of things that are nothing to do with what the original book says, but things that I want to say. So it's sort of autobiographical in that way? Well, it's, yes, every work's autobiographical in some way. And yes, it is. So it's, been, it's also been turned into an app. It's not turned into an app. Uh, no, I made an app from it so that people can have it on their little machines and so forth and actually use it as an oracle as well, which some people have done with some success. What do you mean by an oracle? Well, you know, you used to, there used to be something called the Virginian Lots and some people used a Bible and you opened it at random and stuck a pin in and that was your advice for the day, like the I Ching. And so I thought, well, people could use this book too in that way. And I've used it myself on occasions. And it sort of works. But then all oracles work because they're mystical and you only find out the meaning later. So they always turn out right. And open to interpretation. Well, the, your interpretation is what makes the thing work. And so some occult phrase that seems to mean nothing when you read it. You think the day after, oh gosh, yes, that was, you know, a lady interviewed me for the Financial Times last week or so, and she put a pin, so to speak, in a page, and it talked about money and art, and I thought, here you are, you see, you come representing money and you're talking to art. How right can it be? Do you miss the process? Do you miss the book itself, making the book? Do I miss it? Yes, that's a big question for me. I mean, what do I do now? So when you've, it's like having been married for 50 years, so to speak, to something or somebody, and then they're not there. But then I sort of reach back to it in a way. I'm bound to bring it back again in some form or other, but not as a book. So what do you think it'll, what's its next reincarnation? I have a sort of idea, but I haven't quite worked out how to do it yet, of making a biography with postcards, another thing that I'm interested in, linking a lot of postcards together to make a life and making a little commentary from my book, seeing how that works. I remember reading about you talking about collecting and how collecting is you know, one of those things that is an incurable pastime. Yes, we call it a disease, really. Yeah. You can't stop. I mean, I, I, there's nothing that much that I collect now, at least as far as I know. But all my life as a child I collected little toys and I put them on the mantelpiece. And now in the mantelpiece of my home still, not little toys but little artifacts from Africa and so forth. So it's only replacing one kind of collecting from another. And I used to collect words too, like the names of cars. I was. I had a whole book of the names of cars and the silliest books you could ever contrive to make, but I was only 10. I wanted to ask you about the game of silence, the chessboard that you have, and whether those items on the chessboard are things you've collected or whether they are pieces you've cast yourself. No, they're made by me, 
And what the imagination was that uh, you'd open some cave or some archaeological dig and you'd find this game, as in fact has, for, you know, has happened in Egypt and so forth. But you wouldn't know the rules of it, but you might like the pieces and how they're arranged on the board. And so I've just done a game in the imagination, which I've never found the rules for, but so I can't win or lose, which is quite nice. No, they're little sculptures, really, but they're little sculptures that look like game pieces. And that's what interested me, was making a game that I could look at and wonder at and think, what on earth happens in this game? Who can do what? Who can move where? And there's one piece that fits over another piece, so perhaps that's something to do. But I've no proof. So, are you a bit of a frustrated archaeologist or a bit of a frustrated anthropologist? An anthropologist wouldn't be too far off the mark. I've always been interested in the things that other cultures make, especially Africa, which I spent a lot of time collecting again, collecting Af African artifacts. And I just, you know, I, I like the first marks that man made and the other things that they've made that seem to be nothing to do with us at all. You know, like the decorations on Aboriginal spears in Australia or the marks made on cave surfaces in other places I've been to. I just love that, that, that impetus to make marks or to make things has existed throughout humankind and perhaps even before, we don't know, because there are some marks that people made in the sand or the dust, or even other creatures which have disappeared. So we don't get the whole oeuvre of early man. You used the line from the Beckett play, I can't go on, I'll go on, a few times in this exhibition. Why are you drawn to that particular quote? Because I'm, I'm 80 years old, so in a sense, I mean, I, I love Beckett's works and those bits uh, which I've quoted elsewhere in other works. And this one grabbed me as, I can't go on, is something that occurs perhaps many times in a day. Uh, but you do go on, you will go on, you must go on, as Beckett says before that. But it, you know, it's a business that, in another quote, better known of Beckett's, you know, no matter, try again fail again, fail better. I mean, that seems to be wonderful to me, that the artist's job is to fail and fail better each time. I, I did draw Beckett. I spent three weeks drawing him. And he's not the only um, writer or performer you've, you can count among your acquaintances. No, I mean, I, I've worked with actors and I've worked with singers and I've worked with musicians. And I've been a musician to some extent, been an actor to some extent. So I like, uh, well, creative people, let's call them that roughly. Yeah, I enjoy their company because we've all got the same job, even though we have different manifestations of it. So how did you select out of a vast number of things that you've made, what you wanted to include in this exhibition? Well, you know, there are uh, actual constraints into what one can do with a show. There are things that belong to other people that don't want to lend them and things that belong to the gallery that they want to put forward in order to sell them. You know, life's real. And uh, some things that I've just done that I want people to see. What do you hope that people will take away from this exhibition that they might not have taken away before from your work? What will people take away from this exhibition? Not, <laughs> Nothing, I hope, in one way. <laughs> well, if they've paid good money over the counter, they're very welcome to take away most of the things here. But, well, if, if there's a spirit going around and that refreshes somebody or helps them do something or find something or just enjoys or finds fun or even finds funny. You know, if somebody laughs at something, there's plenty of things to laugh at here, I hope. What's, what's the funniest thing here? Well, there are some things that you wouldn't know were funny unless you know the background story of them. Like there's a skull in this group of skulls which is covered in orange peel. It's called the skull of the peeler. Well, I made quite a lot of works in orange peel which were about a serial killer, a woman serial killer, I hasten to add, whose name was the Peckham Peeler, that's what she was called. 
and I gave her the name Clementine Seville, which sounded not pretty orangey to me. And she leaves a rhyme behind wherever she goes after having taken the member off whoever was, she was uh, murdering. This is a real woman or a fictional woman? No, it's a fictal, fictional woman. I made these penises out of orange peel and little rhymes underneath, and that's the skull of the peeler. So it's, you've got to know a lot of things to know why that's amusing. Well, the idea here is that uh, Shakespeare actually goes to Elsinore. That's the fiction element, although, of course, he might have done. And he has to wait in the library, being a sort of servant-type person compared with the grand people in the castle. And he looks along the shelves of the library and he keeps on seeing these books with various titles, Sea of Troubles, To Take Arms, Pangs of Love, that's not a bad title, Cowards of Us All, hmm. Fashion Slave, Hot Blood, The Mousetrap. Hmm. Yes, I, I can see uh, Flashes of Merriment, Unnatural Acts, all good titles, but suddenly he gets the idea that these are all phrases he can use in the play because they seem to hang together. Like you and your um, book, The Human Man. Yes. And so he spends some time in the library, learns all these phrases, and goes home and writes Hamlet, which includes them all. And these are all real books. I mean, they're all real book titles and real authors. All these titles are in some way incorporated into Hamlet? Or is it just yes, no, that all, all comes out of Hamlet. You know, perchance to dream. And in that sleep of death, what dreams may come? when we have shuffled off these mortal, this mortal coil. You know, it's all there. And there, there are titles you may not recognize initially, but uh, you would if you ran through them all. You say, oh, these things have something in common. What, a, what he, would he do? And he the cue for passion that I have. Oh, dear, I see, you know. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. This is just one section which is from to be or not to be, just from one speech. And they're all book titles, that's quite... Yeah, to be or not to be. Amazing. Whether well, it is better in the mind, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms, a sea of troubles, to sleep no more a chance to dream, which is, of course, a well-known musical by Ivor Novello. You studied English um, at Oxford. Do you think you would have been a different kind of artist if you studied art instead? I would be a different kind of person if I didn't en done anything that I, you know, anything other than what I did. So, yes, it was part of my life. I studied English because it was the easiest thing to do at Oxford, and I wanted to be in plays, which is what, mostly what I did do, and sing and do other things, fool around. I mean, it's not very difficult to get a, to get a degree in English. You only have to read a few books, and what more pleasant than that? That's exactly what I find myself doing right at the moment, because I'm judging the Man Booker Prize with some other unlikely people, and. <laughs> So I have to read a novel a day. So I'm still reading books. Nothing changes and everything changes. <laughs>